Good evening, everyone. I'm Kara McCarty. I'm the Curatorial Director of Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, and I'm thrilled to see all of you here this evening. Cooper Hewitt's purpose is to inspire, educate, and empower people through design, and we do this through our education programs, publications, our online content and discussions, our wonderful education uh, programs, as well as our National Design Awards. Design Talks, which is generously funded by Adobe Foundation, makes possible this wonderful series that we've started that focuses on a lot of contemporary design issues and highlights many of today's um, practitioners, design practitioners, including awardees of the National Design Award. Next month, the final talk for this season will be the interior design firm Adlin Darling Design from San Francisco, who will discuss their designs and the philosophy of incorporating senses and addressing senses in their designs. For tonight's event, please check out our website. Um, we are being live streamed, and after tonight's program, one can watch this program again on, our, on Cooper Hewitt's website. As many of you know, Cooper Hewitt is undergoing a major renovation. We've been closed the past couple of years, but it's very exciting. At the end of this year, we are planning a major reopening. Uh, as part of this renovation, we're gaining 60% more gallery space, a much needed re restoration of the historic mansion. And we are also, it was an opportunity to completely reevaluate and reimagine what a new Cooper Hewitt could be as well as the 21st Century Design Museum could be. In late fall this year, we will celebrate the opening, and I'm sure you'll be hearing a lot more about that. Tonight, we are delighted to welcome two National Design Award winners, landscape architect Margie Ruddick and design patron award winner Jeanette Sadek Khan. Margie Ruddick is recognized for a pioneering environmental approach to urban landscape design and has been called a landscape design icon by Dwell Magazine. Ruddick fosters the idea of nature in the city through projects like New York's Queens Plaza and Trenton Capitol Park on the Delaware River. Ruddick's international work includes the Shalim Retreat in India and the Living Water Park, the first ecological park in China. Margie's forthcoming book is entitled Wild by Design. Jeanette Sadek Khan, Commissioner of New York City Department of Transportation from 2007 to 2013, spearheaded the redesign of some of New York's most iconic sites from pedestrian plazas to the rollout of bicycle sharing program. In her new role as principal at Bloomberg Associates, Jeanette and her team will work with a global consulting firm to help improve the quality of life for citizens around the world. And I'd like to mention that the Design Patron Award is not something that is decided upon by the, national, by the jurors for the National Design Award. It is an award that is determined by the museum and is given to an individual in recognition of outstanding support and patronage within the design community. The Design Patron Award acknowledges how Jeanette's incredible initiative has changed the way New Yorkers travel about and interact in the city. And in fact, I've noticed right outside the studio here, I'm looking at one of her park benches. <laughs> A little bit uh, about tonight's program, and then we'll, we'll jump in and get started. Um, our two speakers will give presentations of their work, then the three of us will come up here have a conversation, but throughout we would love to encourage questions from the audience, and there will be two microphones here at either aisle, and if you would like to pose a question, please come up to the microphone, um, and we'll be happy to call on you. So thank you very much. Our first speaker is Jeanette Sadek Khan. Well, thank you, Kara. It is great to be here, uh, and uh, as many of you have seen, uh, a lot of the recent work that we've done uh, on New York City streets. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about some of that work. Um, walking around the streets of New York today, uh, you see a variety of designs that you uh, didn't see a few years ago. And hopefully we'll be able to see some of them. 
<laughs> there is a bench outside, as was mentioned. There's a bike lane out there as well. Um, but yeah. Maybe I can just mime the changes. Okay. Um, but many of you know, you see pedestrian islands, you see bike share stations, you see bike lanes, you see pedestrian countdown clocks. Um, there's really a new vocabulary uh, that's out there that people use uh, when they're walking around New York City streets. And it's very different from the old vocabulary. There we go. Um, the 21st century designs really focused on moving people as quickly as possible from point A to point B, and to a large degree missed all of the other ways that a street uh, was used. And you can really see this in this, this design for Times Square uh, in, 19, uh, in the 1950s. No. There we go. Uh, so that's Times Square in the 1950s. Um, you can see it in the design for Grand Army Plaza, uh, which uh, this is in the 1920s. Um, oh, OK. Next slide. <laughs> OK. Um, I think this approach was really epitomized um, in the Futurama exhibit in the World Fair, uh, which was in 1939. Um, and what do you see, what is missing from all of these images? People, exactly. Next slide. I'm going to go like this, and that's next slide. So people, you know, streets are some of the most valuable assets that uh, a city has, but our streets have not been designed for people. Uh, and somehow, all the dysfunction uh, on New York City streets uh, has has evolved into this kind of acceptance, right? We sort of accept what's out there uh, on city streets. We've become used to the notion of streets out of balance. And the design of a street will largely tell you what to do. Uh, the design of this street clearly tells you to shelter in place. <laughs> the design of this street uh, says free parking. Uh, and this one is like an it's like a tarmac, you know? It's a message that says either, you know, get ready for takeoff, gentlemen, start your engines. This one, uh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, this one says, anything goes. Yeah, that, there was that one. <laughs> it's working, okay. So, okay, anything goes. This one clearly says, bike at your own risk. <laughs> uh, a street can also highlight what's largely missing. Uh, what's missing here would be a sidewalk, a crosswalk, uh, a bus stop. And you know, when you think about it, New York is known as this great walking city, right? But what we found uh, when we did some surveys is there's just there's no place to sit down. It's like an oxymoron, right? And so we have actually got lots of experience building parking spaces. Uh, but we don't have much experience uh, building spaces for people to sit down. And Mayor Bloomberg's Plan YC changed that. And while administrations tend to think in four-year terms and business as usual, uh, Mayor Bloomberg took the long view. He recognized that we needed to make course corrections along the way so that when we opened the door in 2030 with a million more people here, uh, we liked what we saw. And he wanted to improve the quality of life in communities and uh, build a much greener city. And this had profound implications for the design uh, of New York City streets, and one that demanded a different approach. And so we prioritized sustainable mobility, making it easier for people to get around by bus and by bike, uh, created uh, pedestrian plazas and areas for people to really take in the city and created safer streets for people uh, walking on foot. So we really took this big picture view of our streets and we addressed a wide range of issues. You know, we can build streets that are safer, that are more accessible, that are attractive to people, that accommodate all users, and it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game between moving traffic uh, and creating uh, a complete street. So we turned this free parking street uh, into a plaza, 
uh, that's become an anchor for the community, uh, an anchor for business. In fact, in the three years since we installed this plaza, retail sales went up 173%, twice that uh, of adjacent areas in the same neighborhood. Uh, you remember the slide of Times Square? Mm -hmm. Uh, it looked virtually the same up until 2009. Uh, and we just recently cut the ribbon uh, on the permanent Times Square. We did this in December. It was somewhat of a rainy day, as you can see. Uh, but it is finally a quality open space that is really worthy of its name as the crossroads of the world. And it's important to note that all of these projects, you know, you see them lined out in temporary materials, you know, with, with planters and paint and, and tables and chairs, but all of the plazas go through the traditional construction process with high quality materials and high quality designs. But if we had started uh, with just presenting Times Square through computer models and visualizations, we would still be talking about it. You know, this notion of moving quickly uh, to change your streets really up until uh, Mayor Bloomberg's tenure was, was largely uh, an imaginative thought. So you see these plazas now all over town, uh, in all uh, neighborhoods, in some phase, or over 60 right now, in some phase of planning, design, or construction. And we brought the same approach to our sidewalks. Uh, you can see this is a, a barren strip of concrete on the Upper West Side. And now uh, it's a well-used place uh, by the community, and we've designed in benches, and there's green infrastructure up there. There are uh, bioswales. Uh, and you can see these benches. Uh, these beautiful benches all over the city. They are request-based, so people request these benches and we put them in. We prioritize them in areas where there's a high volume of pedestrians, particularly focusing on uh, areas with a high concentration of seniors uh, who often need to take a load off. We have put, uh, uh, along with everybody else, um, we put in almost 900 uh, of these to date. We also took the same approach in looking at the opportunities to repurpose our underutilized uh, asphalt. Uh, and so you can see here, we took uh, this street, um, which was along a major transit corridor, and repurposed it, created one of our first uh, select bus service routes. Um, New York City has the largest bus fleet in North America, and it has the slowest bus speeds, uh, eight miles an hour. As you probably know, you can walk across town faster than taking the bus. And uh, my traffic commissioner used to say that the only way to get across town was to be born there. <laughs> so that is really not the mark of a world-class city. So we brought this approach to all five boroughs, and you can see them uh, all over town, those uh, beautiful red painted lanes. Uh, buses move 20% faster, 20% increase in ridership on all of the routes, uh, the only bus routes that have an increase in ridership across the city. Um, we also took streets that were basically runways um, for speeding, uh, especially late at night, um, and turned them into leafy uh, uh, neighborhoods, uh, residential streets. We built in bike lanes. We built in the uh, green uh, medians, uh, narrowed uh, the street on the right-hand side, um, and uh, put in a, a good traffic calming there. And we brought this approach to Grand Army Plaza. You can see this was its tidal pool of traffic. Um, and it became this pedestrian and bike gateway uh, to Prospect Park um, that is much safer uh, and much more attractive. This gives you a sense of the kind of scale of traffic calming strategies that we've implemented all over the city. Um, and it's not just in the traffic calming strategies. You can also see this. Uh, as a result of our investment in uh, our bike network. Um, you can see here, um, we put down pedestrian islands, which actually anchor all of our uh, protected bike lanes. And um, they pay big dividends. You know, people know where to stand. They're much more predictable streets. Um, and we worked really, really hard uh, to implement an interconnected network. So this is the network in 2007. And this is the network in 2013. It may be hard to see. I like doing this. I could do this all day. It looks so easy. We just draw the lines on the map, and there we go, with no, no issue whatsoever. Um, but we built about 400 miles uh, of this network. We created key connections to the bridges, created the first parking protected uh, bike lane, new design. And then we augmented that with that, that bike backbone with a new bike share system. How many of you have used the bike share system? Great. Well, then you know, we've got 6,000 bikes. We've got 330 stations. 
Um, we delivered it quickly. Uh, in just 11 months, uh, people have taken 7 million rides and they've ridden uh, nearly f uh, 14 million miles. Uh, that's the qu equivalent of 550 miles uh, around the earth. Um, I don't know what it is in terms of calories spent and pints of Cherry Garcia consumed, but it's a lot. Uh, so it's got that health dividend as well for people, you know, that can just use it quickly uh, to get their errands done. Uh, enhancing the form and function of our streets also uh, included our newly designed bike racks, um, which was selected through a design competition uh, thanks to the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum, National Design Museum, uh, who hosted the competition. And with these new designs, uh, we have them in, uh, installed all over the city. There are now two, two, 20,000 uh, bike racks. Uh, on the streets of New York. And we also used this design when we were moving from single space, muni, uh, single space meters to muni meters. Um, and instead of having to worry about taking out the, the pole and filling the hole with concrete, we just pulled the head off the meter and looped on the, the new bike rack loop design, and voila, we had uh, a new bike rack uh, on the old poles. Now, many of you have probably gone through the frustration of trying to interpret what a parking sign actually says. And so our traffic sign used to look like these totem poles that you see on the left. They were four colors, you know, they were all in caps. They were like screaming at you, but you just couldn't figure out what they said. Um, you really kind of needed a PhD in DOT to kind of figure out what was, what was said. Um, but you can see on the right, we, we simplified it, uh, created new design, easy to read, you know, two colors, you uh, uh, can see what's there. And it was uh, thanks to a lot of hard work um, from the design team at Pentagram uh, that we uh, were delivering these uh, new designs to the streets of New York. We also took street design uh, to zen-like levels uh, with this curbside haiku. And we have these profound safety messages uh, with this 575 um, syllable structure, and you can see these uh, all over the city. Uh, they were created by John Morris. We created them in a way so that people could just discover them, you know, as they're walking across the street. We also created a system of signage for pedestrians, which was a revolutionary uh, thought. You know, when you think about it, we've got a great system of signs for cars, but uh, not a lot of signage for pedestrians. And we also did a survey. Uh, and we found that at any given time, 10% of New Yorkers are lost. <laughs> and that's just the 10% that will admit it. <laughs> so we uh, clearly had the need uh, for a pedestrian signage system. So we developed an easy to read system. Um, it's got all the landmarks, transit uh, stops on there. Along, you can see the yellow line, there's a radius which tells you um, five minutes, you know, what's within a five minute walk, what's in a, uh, 20 minute ride. Um, and we also install them, you can see on the right, we install them on the uh, select bus service route on Nostrand Avenue, and that's uh, Tom Prendergast from the MTA. He's been an incredible partner uh, at the MTA uh, with Mike Bloomberg when we were launching uh, our last uh, SBS route uh, at the end of last year. I think the lesson from all of this is to follow the people. And by tracing their lines, the way they walk, uh, through the city, you can design new and better ways of getting around. Um, you can see this in Midtown. Uh, uh, there, this was a, a, a mid-block crossing from 51st to 57th Street. People would, you know, constantly walk mid-block to get to the uh, public areas there. Um, so we knit them together and, you know, followed the design lines of the of the desire lines of the pedestrians and created Six and a Half Avenue, um, which captured the fancy of many. Um, and it really went a long way to uh, addressing the informal but dangerous conditions that had been there uh, for decades. And sometimes, you know, improving the function and attractiveness of a street uh, doesn't require uh, asphalt and it doesn't require paint. It just requires, you know, opening it up to people. Uh, this is during our summer streets program where we close Park Avenue uh, to cars from uh, the Brooklyn Bridge to 72nd Street on select Saturdays in August. A uh, huge uh, number of people, 25,000 people, I think, a weekend. And, um, you know, it, it allows you to do things like see your city in a whole new way. You can see Grand Central Terminal without getting worried about getting run over. Um, we also repurpose some of our assets there. Uh, the Park Avenue Tunnel, as you know, uh, goes underneath Park Avenue. Um, we opened up the tunnel for the first time in almost 100 years. 
and people could enjoy it, walk through it. We created the sound and light uh, installation thanks to Rafael Lozano Hammer. Uh, and you know, people could see the space instead of you know, honked, you know, honking and and uh, fumes. And when you think about it, with over 6,000 miles of streets and 12,000 miles of uh, sidewalks, New York City is one huge canvas. And um, this large gallery is actually run by the first DOT Commissioner for Art and Urban Design, Wendy Foyer, who I believe is in the back. Wendy? No? Wendy is in the back. <laughs> Raise your hand. Wendy Foyer, uh, who has done so much uh, to transform uh, the streets of New York and bringing art uh, to neighborhoods all across the city. Um, you can see uh, this here. This is a, a, a piece by Cara Lynch. This is, again, is that free parking uh, uh, plaza. Uh, this is a great art uh, installation by David Ellis. Uh, this is a Peace and Justice mural by Shepard Ferry at the Manhattan Bridge. Easter eggs at the gateway to the Staten Island Ferry. Um, we look at our own facilities. This is part of a bridge facility um, fence underneath the Manhattan Bridge. Um, we took a new look at the ubiquitous New Jersey, the Jersey barriers that you see everywhere uh, and, and use local artists to transform those transition spaces. This is a yellow swoosh on 4th Avenue. Uh, this is a really fanciful David. Uh, a red hoop in uh, Union Square. Uh, a very cool light installation that we did on the uh, Manhattan Bridge. We've also enlisted kids to participate and community groups to participate in all of these projects. Uh, you can see the stenciling they're doing here and you can see the result, um, which is great. Uh, uh, the flooring uh, for one of our uh, bike share stations, a really great gateway, energizes the neighborhood. Um, we also did a design competition for our streets. This is in Times Square when, when it was the temporary materials. Uh, this is Molly Dilworth. What, we, what she did was she took a NASA a uh, heat signature map of Times Square and translated into colors and then laid it down uh, in Times Square. It looked like this beautiful uh, river. All of this added up to streets. It's not just beautifully designed streets and you know streets that work better, you know, and that's a green, crunchy thing. It these designs led to streets that were safer, that worked better for business, uh, that uh, just allowed much more mobility. And when you think about it, the streets of New York had been in suspended animation for decades. It was like they couldn't be changed, right? And what I think we were able to show with these new designs is that it's possible to change the streets of a city. We codified all of these changes, so these weren't just one-off projects, in a new street design manual that was the work of 11 city agencies coming together over uh, a couple of year period of time, not the sexiest you know, project, but one of the most important projects uh, that was delivered because it actually changed the DNA of New York City streets. And it doesn't depend on who's the transportation commissioner. It doesn't depend on who the mayor of the city of New York is. This is the playbook for New York City streets going forward. Um, we also work with NACTO uh, to uh, take this approach and uh, uh, bring it uh, to other cities and with an urban street design guide and an urban bikeway design guide. Um, so the changes that you see on New York City streets have seen uh, changes uh, all over the country. When you think about it, the design guides um, that have been used are really 50 years old. The MUTCD, the AASHTO design guides, the green guides, they're, they're 50 years old and they're designed for interstates, you know, really designing streets for people to get from Iowa to uh, Ohio. Um, but this provided a permission slip for cities to innovate because they had a new guidebook to point to, to say, no, this is an authorized design. So it's had a huge impact. Um, this is a new plaza in uh, uh, Silver Lake in Los Angeles. This is a new uh, parking protected lane in Portland, Oregon. Uh, this is a new 20 mile an hour residential zone in Mexico City. Um, so. Uh, well-designed streets are really, they're not luxuries and nice to have. Uh, and they really don't need to come at the expense of other modes of transportation like the car. Uh, not long, this is First Avenue uh, today. And not long ago, it looked like this. So you can design your streets uh, differently. You can bring in mobility, you can bring in safety, you can make them attractive. Um, you need to design right up front. Designing for peds and bikes and buses shouldn't be a 
from leftover materials. It should really be designed in the front end. Uh, and that's how you create world-class streets, and that's how you create a world-class city. It doesn't take decades. It doesn't take millions. It takes vision. It takes political leadership and courage. And it takes the energy of communities all across the city uh, to make it happen. And we need streets that are as dynamic uh, as the people who live here. So thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic. Um, a big overview of the whole city. I'm actually going to be talking about a very specific project to look at it from start to finish, this big tangle of metal and asphalt that was Queens Plaza <clears throat> until fairly recently. Uh, it was a, a, just a morass of the conditions I think Jeanette was talking about. It's a very critical point. It's kind of the gateway between Manhattan and Queens and Long Island City. It also has eight different subway stops and bus lanes, so it's really a transit hub, and it was possibly the fourth new commercial hub for the city, but it was really a wreck and uh, very dangerous and had some very, very difficult conditions, I think many of which we just saw, including just this acres of asphalt. This is the project um, site with a park at the top end of it, and then a streetscape taking uh, the streets all the way down to the Queensboro Bridge. Uh, it was quite dangerous, and also, not only was it cluttered, you saw it was just kind of a visual mess, but also it was really polluted, a lot of uh, pollution from buses and cars. It was also really noisy. Um, the the seven-line curves around the space and makes this high-pitched horrible sound that was referred to as the screech. So in order to deal with all of these um, sort of adverse conditions, uh, Department of City Planning <clears throat> and EDC in 2004 launched the Queens Plaza Bicycle and Pedestrian Landscape Improvement Project that was intended to reinvent Queens Plaza as a place that would be attractive. It would be a place where people would want to work, they would want to live. And how did they do this? Well, when we first started to do these images once we'd done the design, these ideas that I think Jeanette was talking about, they were fairly radical. This was before 2007, and Jeanette got on the job and started to steal uh, traffic lanes. Um, but the idea that you could actually take away traffic lanes had not been formalized. The idea that you could have a green, lush landscape that was part of the urban infrastructure was not really mainstream. It was kind of uh, fringe. The idea of rain gardens and sustainable urban drainage and permeable behaving, this was not in the kind of uh, current uh, common parlance of landscape design. But now it's 2014. All of these projects have happened. Queens Plaza is finished. This is the mainstream, the idea that urban infrastructure can actually be beautiful, be a park, have transit running through it, pedestrians, bicyclists. It can also operate ecologically. This park filters all of the stormwater and uh, cleanses it. So the idea that this actually can be reality is actually mainstream now. You see in um, most of the landscape architecture magazines now projects like this where urban infrastructure is not something bad. It's an opportunity, and it can be something really beautiful. And the goals are very simple. You know, the goals, I think Jeanette was talking about, just humanizing infrastructure. The infrastructure is often so daunting, and the scale is so huge. And just making it a place that people can actually occupy, and also making these places safer. They were often very dangerous. <coughs> Queens Plaza had many fatalities year after year. People just trying to cross the street from north to south, and, you know, like, 12 to 14 lanes of traffic. And then also there was just the perceived safety, not the, um, not the actual uh, danger of crossing the street, but just the idea that these under spaces, um, there were strip clubs all along the south end. Rikers Island prisoners were dropped off in the middle of the night with you know $3, and it was just perceived as a place that was not safe. So kind of addressing that. And then also making these places greener, not just greener in terms of more vegetation, but greener in terms of actually having a net positive impact, really um, making the environment better and not worse. So how do you actually address design here? Um, I think we've looked at all of these different projects that are um, many, many different kind of, uh, many different approaches. In this case, these projects, this project is unbelievably complex huge team, not only urban designers, architects, Linda Pollack, I just saw come in, uh, and um, engineers, civil engineers, 
structural engineers, traffic engineers, lighting designers, and this massive team. And you have to have a very strong design process and design hand in order for it not to be a kind of design by committee. So really organizing the process very clearly to run through you know, the studies of the site, developing the actual design language, um, and then integrating the performance issues. How are you going to clean the water? How are you going to actually make the environment better? You're going to mitigate flooding, um, actually make the place cooler. These are all things that need to be integrated to, into the design and not sort of afterthoughts and not thought of as the sort of sustainable component, but actually completely part of the design process. So how do you actually imagine these places and visualize them? I think we saw some really great visualizations. <clears throat> and in this case, this is actually Trenton the Capital um, Parks. You can actually see, the reason I'm showing this is it's so clear. Queens Plaza is very hard to image. This is so clear when you see all of the elevated highway and the acres and acres of parking that was Trenton, New Jersey, uh, from the State House down to the river. And we won the competition to kind of rethink the whole downtown. And not just to make it a park, but to make it a park that actually functions in, as infrastructure, a new road moving inboard, uh, all sorts of um, issues of bulkheads and old spans being reused and uh, bridges running across it. So it's not just a park. It operates on many, many different levels. All of these projects need to operate on many different levels at once. So they're not just doing one thing. And that's why they're amazing projects, but it's also why they're difficult to do. So in the case of Trenton, it has to function as a streetscape. It has to function as a park. It has to function as a waterway. These are all s similar to the Queens Plaza. It also has to restore a lot of connections that have been broken, connections between neighborhoods, connections between the city and the river, and also the connections between the modes of transport that have been so siloed that they've been thought of as very, very distinct, segregated uh, ways of moving. And so this project was trying to redress that. And here, Queens Plaza was just this huge tangle. How do we actually start to um, approach the design of the project? And the obvious way, we started to study the site. Uh, this, design, this, this drawing by Sandro Marpillero and Linda Pollock shows how intensely, this is actually the final design, but it shows how in, intensely they studied. And we all studied the actual structure of the elevated trains and the bridge and the crosswalks. This is designing projects like this, you do not do this at your office desk. You have to be there on the site. And you have to internalize these really complex conditions. So this was the first sort of ideogram that we did, because at the same time that you're doing all of the studies, you have to have a kind of a vision. And these are not design um, sort of proposals, but what they are is kind of visual prompts. How do you start to develop a design language that's going to take you into the design of this place? Mm -hmm. So this is like a prompt to the team we want to, uh, of what the design intent was. We want to integrate infrastructure and possible production of energy and deal with the acoustics and the um, horrible noises and sounds. We want to reconnect a lot of the site. We also want to just start to integrate the kind of media that we use, plants and um, water and light. So this is a sort of visual prompt that then we went into the project more deeply and started to develop a real vocabulary saying we want to raise the grade in a lot of places to buffer the sound from the roadbed. So we just said, OK, we're going to berm up in places. We're going to create a kind of a blue ribbon so water can flow through the site, get cleansed as it goes. We want to sort of green the infrastructure. We want to create sort of filtering of planting. So this was still abstract, but getting a little more real. And then finally, the final project, and this is the plan, showing the entire site from Dutch Kills Green, the sort of large two plus acre site down through all the medians toward the Queensboro Bridge. The final product, the final design, is very green and very lush, uh, a little more lush than you saw in that earlier diagram. And there were many reasons for this, but one of the big reasons was Amanda Burden. And she took a look at all of our studies and said, you know, this place really needs to be a refuge. It needs to be a green, lush place where people can find respite from the chaos that's all around us. So we actually were kind of given license to do something that was much lusher than what would have been normally acceptable. And that was the kind of leadership to say, you know what, this isn't normal that you would be told to design something that's going to be maybe a little higher maintenance, uh, a little less defensible in terms of space, but it needs to be really dense and lush. So the actual plantings are very layered. When you 
go into the park, it feels, it, although it's porous, there are no real boundaries around it, it feels very immersive. You kind of disappear into these layers of planting. And something really interesting happened with the acoustics. We had been told by the acoustical engineer that there was really very little we could do about the noise because we didn't have the big distance for planting, you know, 100 feet to buffer the noise. We couldn't grade up. So we thought, OK, well, we're still going to make it very dense and very lush. And the Landscape Foundation did a study last year that compared before and after. And they found that we actually reduced the plantings and all of the work actually reduced the noise level by about 23%, which is almost a quarter. And it goes from decibels in the 80s, which is like unlivable, to the 70s, which is like one of the Broadway streets where it's a street, but you actually can uh, tolerate it. And the, the plantings have ended up being like sponges. You know, plantings can absorb water, filter water, pollution. But in this case, they also really absorb no noise in a way that wasn't predicted by the engineers. So this guy, you know, he's sitting right underneath the elevated. You can see the cabs, the cut through the, um, through the, uh, the park that the road goes through. That uh, is about 30 feet away from him. He doesn't seem to notice. There's a big arc of hornbeams that kind of buffer that area. There's the constructed wetland that um, is, runs through that filters all of the water is right alongside him. So there are so many different layers of landscape between him and this big infrastructure that he doesn't seem to notice that much. And then also, it's a real magnet for people for gatherings. Even though there's the train and there's all this sort of noise around it, people seem to feel that it's a haven. They have meetings there, they have performances, and people really gather there. And they seem to think of it as a very uh, a, a, a sort of a haven-like space. So once you leave the kind of quote park, how do you actually turn the design inside out and start to deal with the streetscape? where there's no real boundary between, you know, quote, park and street. And we actually had to look at the flows through the, through the site, the flows of vegetation, the flows of pedestrians and bicyclists and cars and buses and all of the furnishings going through the site. And to develop a design language that intersects with the language of DOT, the striping. So the graphic here was developed so that there wouldn't be any kind of boundary between what was the street and what was the park. And I think that the the language of it in terms of design uh, really gives you a sense that the entire street is the public realm, that there is no place where you actually are prohibited from being. And you know where the infrastructure used to be a barrier so that it really cut off uh, various neighborhoods and it was a it was a very prohibitive thing. Now the new infrastructure with that with that old elevated becomes a conduit to move people and bicyclists through the city more easily. So the infrastructure itself, this is the one part of the project that hasn't happened yet, um, how to transform the structures. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the agencies, all the different agencies involved in these projects. And this is the one thing, Jeanette was talking about leadership. This is the one thing that hasn't really happened yet, which is all of these different portions of the site are actually controlled by different agencies. So the MTA controls the elevated. So in this era, when we were designing this, we couldn't actually get permission to attach things or touch the structure. They were painting it. But Marpilio Pollock did this beautiful study of the structure and found that whereas you see that this just looks like chaos and you can't tell what's what, they actually found that there were these volumes in the structure. And if you actually wrapped a scrim inside and lit it, you would have this landscape that's sort of like this hanging lanterns. And not only is it really beautiful, but it also improves wayfinding because it starts to make distinctions between gaps where you can walk and the, and the volumes. So it actually increases navigability of the site. So that hasn't happened yet, but you can see what it would do. This is at night, Lenny Schwendinger was the lighting designer. And you can see this kind of black hole where the elevated is. But this is what it would look like once this project happens. All of the projects that I think Jeanette was talking about and that we deal with in the city have a very, very uh, critical issue in terms of scale. The scale of this infrastructure is so big that it's very hard to kind of address it and meet it and kind of stand up to it when you're designing the landscape. And in this design that we did, where the planting is very detailed, very lush, and kind of soft, and it looks here fairly soft, the actual structure of the landscape is quite big and tough. Um, 
this is Long Island City, it has an industrial history, uh, and we wanted to do something that was in keeping with that sort of feel and the character of the place. So if you look at, this was right after construction, if you look at the big moves, they actually are quite big scale. And you need to do something like that just to sort of stand up to the power of this infrastructure. And so you can see in these images the kind of large swaths, broad brush strokes of the landscape to kind of meet the big strokes of the elevated. And even in this walkway, this is the constructed wetland at the middle that actually filters the water from the park. Um, the walkway through it, we had to size so that it actually felt like it was part of the city. So you weren't making like a little walkway in kind of faux nature. You always want this to feel as if it's urban. And this image, you can see where that pathway intersects the boardwalk. You want, we wanted it to feel like it's part of Long Island City, so when you're looking at the buildings, you actually can connect the two, and it really feels urban. It does not feel like um, the fake country. So once we deal with the big scale, we also went to a level of detail that was kind of unusual. Um, we worked with Michael Singer, the artist, to integrate him, the public art component, into all of the aspects of this, all of the design. So we designed, Marpilio Pollock and Michael Singer and our team designed these curbs that have a functional reason for being there. The water is actually flowing along those curbs and into the wetland where the water is being filtered, um, but the curbs also keep people from slipping uh, into the wetland, so it's very functional, but we also wanted a kind of layer of tactile um, sort of quality and sort of the idea that there was some hand in this, that it actually, I think, seeing all of the art projects that Jeanette was talking about, there's something about this as, as an artifact. It's not just a machine, and it's not just um, you know a sort of environmental project. It's actually an artifact in the city. And the sort of urban um, motif, these striations, really do reflect the whole feel of the infrastructure and of the city. And this is the curbs where the water flows through. The paving is also, um, with the, the benches, we wanted to kind of create a sense of a very thick ground plane. So rather than just having the paving be like a crust on the earth and then the furnishings are kind of strewn on top of it, the benches kind of rise up out of the ground plane and out of the paving and you have the sense of this very earthbound ground plane that also can kind of um, deal with the scale of the place. Some of the pavers can actually be butt, butted together and they're just a, a sort of a traditional paving, but then they also can be laid with gaps in them. And you can see here that where there's not a lot of traffic, plants will just volunteer or they're planted. And so gradually over the years, there will be a kind of a greening of this ground plane and of the pavers. Those striations also actually do something to reduce the heat. The shadow in these striations actually lower the heat of these pavers. So it works on many, many different levels. And then we also were integrating planting in the no-go zones, the areas where we did not want people to walk, very dangerous, right near that roadway that cuts to the site. And we used, we reused the paving from the roadbed and from the sidewalks and um, saved, I think, something like $400,000 in paving costs, but also created something that feels more intentional, more like a sort of an urban garden out of which this uh, infrastructure kind of rises. So finally, I just wanted to talk for two seconds about the design of performance, the design of um, this environmental system as a little bit of an object lesson in, I was talking about agencies, in how to actually get these projects done to be really whole. Uh, we wanted to filter, this was the first, one of two first pilot projects for the New York City's High Performance Infrastructure Guidelines. So it was needed to be a demonstration of how you could really design uh, a whole system that's going to really have an environmental benefit. So this is the wetland that runs through the project, uh, through the site, and we wanted to filter all of the water from the park on the left-hand side. You can see into this constructed wetland, which is where the boardwalk runs through. We also wanted to filter all of the stormwater from the street. No park had done this in the city before, and we felt that it was really important for the park to deal with the sort of filthy water with the trash that uh, and the oil that was actually now just going into the sewer system and eventually into our waterways, so we could deal with this. But we had one problem with this, which is that we had this little device that was going to filter out all the particulates and the trash from the street runoff before it goes into those chambers where the water then settles and eventually percolates down and recharges the groundwater, really reducing the load of water that goes into the waterways and generally cleansing the water. We couldn't actually 
get any agency involved to take ownership of this and say that they would maintain it. We could design it, we could actually have it built, but we couldn't figure out who was actually going to maintain it. And not any fault of any agency. You can see when you look at this plan of who owns what in, in uh, Dutch Kills Green, that DOT controls the streets, Parks Department controls the green space, streets controls the street, the, the pathways and the sidewalks, DEP controls the gutters and the sewer system, and the MTA controls the elevated. So when you see this, when you see the section, you can see where the problem was. So DOT is on the right with the purple. You can see why would they want to go through DEP property into Parks property to maintain something that was going to filter their own water? Why would DEP want to go into Parks property to actually uh, maintain something that's going to be filtering DOT's w water that's pretty much out of their control? And then why would Parks want to maintain something on their property that's going to be filtering water that's completely out of their jurisdiction? So it was just a matter of like a hot potato. So we kind of despaired a little bit, and we sort of realized this probably was not going to happen. We were going to filter the water only from the park and let sort of future generations and future parks actually do the, the heavy lifting of the street, polluted water from the street. So we kind of gave up. Um, but I, it was a very bitter pill to swallow, and I became something of a pest. And at places like um, New York City Green Codes Task Force, I, I would collar people like poor Rit here, who a lot of you probably know, and say, you know, we're doing this great rewriting of the codes to be green, but we have this problem with Queens Plaza. And you know, he would say, you know, he knew all about this kind of thing and did not have the jurisdiction to say, okay, well, we're going to get DEP to take ownership of this. So. At that level, we actually had, we'd done everything we could, we couldn't actually get this to happen. So we, the drawings were done, it was designed only to handle this, the water from the park, but a year later, I just happened to be at a benefit, which I don't do very often. And who am I sitting next to but Adrian Benepe, the parks commissioner. And he said, how are things going? I said, they're really fine, thank you. But, and I just couldn't let it go, and so I said, we have this little problem. We had this problem with Queens Plaza and the TerraClean hydrodynamic separator, which nobody would actually maintain. And he said, isn't that something that you just back up to every two years with a truck and you vacuum? He, he knows maintenance, Adrian Benepe. You just back up to and you, and you vacuum it out every two years. And I said, yes, it is. He said, well, we'll do it. At that point, it was too late. And I just thought, oh my god, we were actually not necessarily talking to all the right people. And this just gets to the issue of leadership, that these projects can be done. Penny Lee started this project 18 years ago. Queens Plaza has pushed this project through from the start. It's been a kind of a grassroots uh, effort. It's been something that the designers have been working on. I've been working on it since 2003. So we have all of these different agencies working on it, but until the person at the top has the kind of regal fiat you know, to say, uh, like Amanda Burden says, this has to be a refuge. Or Jeanette Sadikhan says, we're going to remove traffic lanes. Or Adrian Benepe says, you know, we're going to maintain this. Against the current practices, you're not necessarily going to have a project that's whole. This project needed to have that leadership in order to be whole, to have the water cycle be whole. So all of these different players need to be really at the table in order to make a place that works, that works well for the community, works well for the neighborhood, works well for the city, it works well for our waterways. So that, for me, is the real moral of the story. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, and brava to both of you. It's really impressive to listen to all that you've done um, in New York City, and it really, it really underscores for me what we always say at the National Design Museum is the, the importance of knowing the power of design to change things, and the impact that the two of you have made in New York City, working with all of your teams, and just a few years' time is really quite staggering. So brava to both of you. And um, it, um, one of the things that came through loud and clear to me as both of you were giving your presentations is, is how accessible the city is now. Um, I think about mobility, which is really about ease of movement, and accessibility, which is about getting to our destination or, 
or meeting our needs. But when I think now about coupling, coupling transportation, landscape design, and how that's really starting to change, making the city much more accessible, is starting to change the form of the city is really quite fascinating. And I think that you both gave some very poignant examples. So um, while you were just talking about leadership, I'd love to just um, discuss that maybe a little bit more right now because um, we've been working, we've been living the last few years um, with the Bloomberg administration, um, who we know, Mayor Bloomberg was very supportive of culture, design, and a lot of very progressive ideas. But it's not true, as we know, of a lot of mayors. And um, in your experience, I mean, there's the Mayor's Institute, uh, which has been very effective um, in this country. But how do we, how do we help educate other mayors about design? Well, a couple things. I think that, um, first of all, I think cities are really at the front line of the innovation that's happening. And I think they know their streets and the communities know their streets better than anybody else. And I think that, that the strategies that we talked about today, um, Claire and I, are they're economic development strategies. Um, you're, you are need to have a different approach to your streets in your city if you're going to continue to grow and thrive. To continue to do the same thing over and over again and expect that you're going to get a better result is, you know, it's illogical, um, if not insane. And the idea that cities are going to continue to grow, um, so we need to figure out ways to repurpose our infrastructure, allocate our assets a little differently to be able to capture that growth and improve the quality of life there. And so in cities around the world, you're seeing them adopt new strategies for mobility, building in bike lanes. Um, bike share has now become the mark of a world-class city. Um, building in uh, a much stronger pedestrian framework uh, for the city. And uh, the, the work that we've done has started to be replicated in cities across the country. Uh, the National Association of City Transportation Officials um, uh, has the 15 largest cities together, the Transportation Commissioner's meeting and exchanging information about what works and what doesn't, is a great convening forum on the transportation side to um, actually implement the kind of changes that we're talking about. And the reason why I talked about the design guidance being so important is because for so many years, for decades, the design guidance that, that cities had to work with was really outdated. And so there really wasn't a way for even progressive engineers and planners that wanted to do something differently. You know, there were all these overarching concerns about liability. And so a lot of the innovations wouldn't be implemented because of the quote unquote liability concerns. So designing a new playbook for cities was really important because it did give them the permission slip to say, hey, it does work here in all these different cities and all these different places are doing it. And so you're starting to see this um, replicated all around the country and actually all around the world. And so cities are sharing you know, this information. And I love that it's become a sort of global competition of who can be greener. Right? And that's a complete sea change mm -hmm. um, from Definitely. what we've seen before. So, and I think that the internet has really helped because you can see very quickly what works. You can see the before and afters. And that information can be uh, exchanged you know, almost immediately. And you can show a street film uh, of you know, summer streets and so show you can close your street and here's what can happen. Or you can repurpose a street to a plaza and here's what can happen. And, and people can visually understand it without having to go through a very long traditional process. So that time to implementation, that time to understanding is completely changed. And I think it really is a global competition mm -hmm. at a time when people and companies can move anywhere. And how do, how do is, this, is this something online? And if it is, where can people find this? NACTO.org uh, is where you go to find the design guides. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> both the Urban Street Design Guide and the Urban Bikeway Design Guide. Uh, and all of the documents that I referenced, uh, this the New York City DOT uh, Street Design Manual, that's all on the uh, New York City DOT website at uh, uh, NYC DOT. Uh, dot.nyc.org. God, only three months and I'm like. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's all there. And, uh, and a lot of the pictures, a lot of the great work uh, that Claire has done and, and other designers have done in terms of the, the plazas is also available. All those PowerPoint presentations are online. 
Margie, do you have, you've been. Well, I just, I want to say about mayors and about, and about um, that I've been on many of those mayors institute and on city design where mayors come and urban designers and landscape designers all kind of consult on an urban design problem. And the problem with that is that the mayors then go back and they have all these amazing ideas and their city managers are like, no, like we're not gonna do it. So having people at Jeanette's level really be there in the room is really criti critical and having the mayors really hire and sort of empower people who are going to make the changes rather than the mayors themselves actually mm -hmm. pushing mm -hmm. is something that I think is really important. I think, you know, adding to that, um, when I've traveled around and showed mayors the work that we've done, the, the, the speed to implementation and the mm -hmm. fact that it doesn't cost millions of dollars is incredibly appealing. Right. So you can show the before and after. You can show a mayor what you could accomplish in a four-year period of time. Right. And that's very, you know, they drool, you know, sort of when they see that because you can actually transform your city. And it's very hard to do otherwise because it generally seems to take, you know, many, many years. You know, we're on our fourth groundbreaking of the Second Avenue subway. You know, the <laughs> transit projects can take a long time to deliver. So to be able to transform your infrastructure in real time in a mayor's term right. is, is, a, is very compelling. And how do you, um, how do you, I mean, it seems like you, both of you kept, meaning, kept mentioning pedestrians and um, citizens. And in fact, what I was um, startled by, <coughs> um, you said you worked for the Department of Transportation, but most of your talk was about people. And here I was thinking about cars and vehicles, et cetera, but it was really about people and pedestrians. And that's something that I think we're seeing all over, is that, the, that everything seems geared towards people now. And a lot of the, in fact, in many communities, there are projects, especially in interstitial spaces, for example, that mm -hmm. are being developed by the local communities. And um, taking abandoned infrastructures, whether it be under the railway tracks mm -hmm. or down the mews or abandoned parking lots. And um, can you give a few more examples, successful examples of that? Well, I think in many cases, what you're you, there's a you know I talk about a new vocabulary on mm -hmm. city streets, and people have a new expectation of their streets now. Mm -hmm. I think they see what a street can look like, mm -hmm. um, and the notion that it's just about moving cars is no longer the operating principle. I think that 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 has changed, and so the idea that we can have a variety of different uses accommodated accommodated on our street is a very very important mm -hmm. uh, idea and. <coughs> All of the programs that New York City DOT implements now, whether it's bike lanes, whether it's plazas, whether it's pedestrian zones, um, whether it is you know 20 mile an hour residential zones, all of those are are transformed into uh, application based programs. So the public is demanding it. They're writing in for it. There's an application process, and if you want to get a plaza, here's what you need. If you want a bike lane, here's what you need. And the, there's a tsunami of demand. And so what's happened is the people are way ahead of the politicians. And they're way ahead of the press in terms of what it is that they want. So I think the sea change is now embedded. You can take a look at the polls, you know, overwhelming support for bike lanes and plazas and bus lanes. Uh, and, you, and you see that, that from the polling, from the demand that, that people have for, uh, in the application pool for these projects uh, is very, very high. So I think that actually the tipping point has been reached and turned. And people do now have a different view. They can see a street and look at it differently and understand you know, what might be there. And designing for people, I think for too long, people have been sort of out of the equation. You know, We really designed our streets for cars, and so it was really out of balance. And so sort of we're, we're engineering people back into the equation now. Yeah, I just also think that the engineering field has really changed because 10 years ago, you would work with an engineer and their job really was to help speed traffic and to help ease traffic flow. And the engineering discipline really has been re-educated so that now they really are doing traffic calming. So rather than speeding up a design speed of 55, they'll say this is for a walking speed of you know eight miles. So I think that the engineering discipline really has changed a lot and that's been a big help. Well, I am. Um, oh, before we go any further, I'd just like to remind um, the audience that we do have two microphones here. We uh, love questions, and at any point, you're welcome to come up and stand by the microphones, and I'd be happy to call on you. 
Um, what, now we're talking about New York City, which has a wonderful density and critical mass, and uh, we knew, know New Yorkers all have opinions, and we want people to know our opinions. What if we go out to the Midwest, a big part of the United States, in these post-industrial cities, and you've got the, the, the vestiges of the downtown, and then there are these often miles of abandoned lots, and then to the suburbs. How would you envision some of your initiatives working in a place like Cleveland or Detroit or St. Louis? Well, the good news is, is they are already doing it. Mm -hmm. And so you see those sure. cities now, and they mm -hmm. are approaching their streets differently. I mean, uh, the NACDO community is very large, almost 50 cities, and they're all you know, working on these different kinds mm -hmm. of strategies. So I think that the message is out there, and I think the opportunity uh, mm -hmm. is out there, and the invitation to work a little differently. I do think it's going to take a little bit longer on the engineering side. I think that we've got <laughs> some. I saw a little. Uh, like, no. We've made some progress, yeah. um, but you know, I've been in a couple of cities lately where you know this was not the uh, standard operating principle. Mm -hmm. um, that really it, it is all about the moving the cars as quickly as possible. And I want to say it's not, it's not anti, this is strategy is not anti-car. Mm -hmm. It's just pro-balance. Right. And so I think that cities, again, to that point of they know that they have to innovate to be able to attract people to live there because there is an expectation that people have about wanting to get around uh, easily and mm -hmm. wanting to be in walkable neighborhoods. And you saw what happened during the recession when you know, the only real estate that really held its value uh, was real estate that was next to transit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, sprawled out uh, housing really lost its value dramatically uh, during the recession. And so I think that all of those signals are there. Um, and you're actually starting to see all of these projects pop um, all around the city, all around the country. Jason, Well, I, I think that a lot of cities are being driven also by the fact that their infrastructure is crumbling. So yeah. where you actually have streets and water systems together, now they're having to be rethought from Philadelphia to Ohio to you know Detroit. So that's a real opportunity to integrate parks and transportation and stormwater management. And often you have the funding to do that through the water mm -hmm. end of it. So I think that that's also ha helping in a lot of cities. You know, one thing we didn't mention was technology, mm -hmm. which has right. also it's completely right. changed uh, the game uh, almost mm -hmm. immediately. I mean, you think about Uber and Lyft and even bike share. You know, these are different, they're different ways to get around. They're different ways to, uh, it's almost instant mobility. And it's actually a brand new wrap sometimes on some old systems. Uber is an old, I mean, it's the black car service, mm -hmm. right? But it's wrapped in a technology wrapper that makes it very appealing and, and, and instantly available. So technology has really transformed, I think, whether it is you know, the instrumentation of our infrastructure, telling mm -hmm. what the state of good repair is on it, um, you know, uh, having real-time traffic signals, you know, that, that actually match what's happening on, real, mm -hmm. on the ground in real time. I mean, those kinds of uh, pieces are really uh, changing the game. Yeah, absolutely, and um, I think you mentioned tsunami before. I, I um, always talk about that technology is hitting us like a tidal wave. Um, certainly what we're doing at the museum, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's throughout society. And um, could you speak a little bit more about maybe some good examples of how the vehicles are connecting and communicating with the technology and even connecting with the street lights and... Well, I think that's the next generation mm -hmm. of infrastructure. You know, it's the sort of s smart infrastructure that's, that's getting formed. And so, you know, it's cars understanding when they're too close to another car, beeping and alerting a driver, or if you're approaching a crosswalk, it will, you know, kick in uh, on a braking system. Uh, it's, it's, it's astonishing to see what is, is happening, um, metering of different roads to, to be able to better manage uh, the traffic. I saw something really cool the other day, which is not quite technology, but it was um, a new design for um, fluorescent lanes right, those, so that you could Holland, see right. those, the, the Holland uh, uh, pilots, so that you could see these lines uh, at night. 
um, which was really cool, you know, to, to address the safety aspect of streets. And, you know, fluorescent colored bikes, you know, that you could see at night yeah, and that paper, signals yeah. that, you know, lights that, you know, will outline a, a lane. I mean, there's a ton of stuff that's out there, even the real-time bus information that's, that now mm -hmm. everybody has on their iPhone. So it's, it's literally from the infrastructure itself Mm -hmm. uh, to the iPhone that, mm -hmm. you know, his act is, is, is transforming. And, you know, it, that innovation just continues apace. It really is. It's extraordinary to see. I mean, planners now need to take into account what's happening with Uber and Lyft and, and, and account for that when they are designing their transport systems. What I find um, um, really interesting, I was actually talking with someone I know who's also in transportation, and she was meeting with um, the different transportation divisions in Los Angeles, and they were getting together. It sounded like for one of the first times together. So this was the, the, the cars, the buses, the bicycles, the um, metros, and, and they all brought the maps of their hubs or their, their networks, and then they superimpose them, and it was really quite fascinating, I think, and very illuminating for all of them to see how many of their hubs really intersected, and their networks intersected, and they were able to really start identifying some key hubs, and it really, I think, underscored for them that transportation was really about mobility, and the f how you could go fluidly from one mode of transportation to the other to get from your desk, you know, from where you are to your destination. Yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. I think, you know, there's the line of necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, and that's certainly the case in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, you know, there's the, as we know, federal funding is going down for transportation, state money is going down, and, and localities are strapped. Mm -hmm. So uh, increasingly the name of the game is looking at it and repurposing the infrastructure that you have a little differently, and then looking to other partners to bring to the table to help deliver, whether it's public-private partnerships on the plaza program, whether it's you know having a sponsor for your city bike program, however it goes, it is looking at different ways of, of uh, matching uh, resources mm -hmm. uh, and need. And um, I think Los Angeles has got some great opportunities to reconfigure or, or um, adapt its system to better uh, move people around that region. Now you, I know that you're traveling around and consulting with, we've both been doing a lot of traveling and consulting with other um, cities and taking your expertise, but what are we learning from other countries? Because I know it's not always us exporting our knowledge. What are some of the greatest things that you've brought in from or looked at from other countries that you think that we could import into the United States? Well, I think we can learn a lot from other countries. I mean, I've learned a lot. I think in a lot of countries are, you know, years ahead of where we are. And so, uh, you know, when I first became transportation commissioner in 2007, one of the first things I did, I ended up taking a trip to Copenhagen. And I saw their uh, parking protected bike lane. And I thought, my God, that's so simple. Mm -hmm. You know, you just pull out the parking from the <laughs> lane. Why don't we do that, you know? So we did that. Um, there are things like that, mm -hmm. you know, with the uh, smart signals, countdown signals. There's just different ways of looking at things, tolling, you know, mm -hmm. pricing infrastructure, um, just some basic ways of dealing um, from a system perspective. Uh, so, and, and different uh, financing mechanisms actually to deliver infrastructure. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot to learn, uh, certainly. And, but it is a two-way street. I think there is a, or a multiple lane street. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there's, lots, there's lots that I've learned and, you know, I continue mm -hmm. to learn from uh, other, other places. But that, that sharing is almost, you know, instantaneous now. So, you know, when we're looking at the fluorescent lines, you know, that were laid down this pilot in, in Holland, Wow, you know, that just instantly goes around the world yeah. and you think, oh, well, why don't we right. try that out, yeah. you know? And that's, that innovation, that instant innovation, mm -hmm. I think is, is reducing the barriers to implementation in fairly dramatic ways. I, I do think, though, that it's, we're, you're talking more about learning from Europe, and when you go in the other direction, things are, have happened so fast in terms of, and I don't know in your travels in Asia, but actually it's quite frightening how quickly things have gone, actually in the old model, in terms of, cars and all of the things that we're talking about actually reeling back, bicycling all of a sudden plummeting, 
car ridership and car ownership all of a sudden just exponential in Asia. And I, I think that um, the World Congress now, or World Summit in uh, Singapore this June is gonna be addressing this issue of how do we actually start to talk about this worldwide and in Asia. I hate to keep coming back to this design guide, which I'm pumping, NACTO uh, street design guide. <laughs> Um, but it is, you know, what, what Margie's talking about is extremely important because we've exported this model from the 1950s of design for cities and that, that model is getting replicated around the world and that has some very negative consequences globally. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if we can get a handle on that, if we can help on that design side and bring some different design guidance to the table, we can help undo, I think, some of the mistakes that we've promulgated mm -hmm. in a way. Um, that are happening around the globe. So looking for a global street design guide uh, is sort of the nat next mm -hmm. natural step. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, I was struck by um, that I read some years ago is that when um, one of the first things poor people do when they get just a bit of money is that they buy a car. Mm -hmm. And um, it's hard to blame them. I mean, we've done the same in this country, throughout this country, but I think you're absolutely right. How do we get ahead of the curve and uh, really in... in right. Well, when you look at... So when I was in, in Chengdu in the capital Sichuan in 1996, and it was unbelievably polluted, but they already were instituting all sorts of programs to try to remediate the water. And it had only been 20 years since the pollution had really, really sort of taken hold. So. It looks terrible right now, but when you look at how quickly uh, countries in Asia have actually started to remediate, it can happen much more quickly than here in some ways because there is this, for instance, in Chengdu, they could actually move, this might not be a great thing, but they could actually move 100,000 people away from the river and completely restore the river. It's not necessarily the best, uh, the, the best way of doing things, but in fact, you can do things much more quickly when you do not have this process. You talked about, Jeanette talked about going to meetings and showing visualizations of Times Square and how long that process would have taken. You don't have to do that in some countries. They actually start to remediate much more quickly and things can actually happen much more quickly to get better. Well, I was surprised how quickly it happened in New York City, in <laughs> Times Square. It was, um, one of the things that I just wanted to say I thought was really fascinating was um, when you were showing your the the um, the bike racks, which I'm so happy to see all over the city now. Um, but there, I thought was so smart, and I really have to to commend you is that the meters, what you sh you showed when they removed the the meters, and I would walk past them every day to work and think now because one day. Someone came out, they took the money out of each of the meters. And then another day, someone came up and they <laughs> took the heads off the meters. And then they put a white cap on the mm -hmm. meters. And I thought, OK, just the cost of how are they going to dig them out of the concrete? And then the next week, there were these new bike racks that had been just sort of slid over them like a sheath. And I just I thought that was really brilliant. Yeah, well, it's again looking at new, 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 bringing new eyes to uh, mm -hmm. a problem, and uh, I want to thank you for the the great design that we got from the competition that we oh, did. Oh, we were very we, happy to be a very part of it. exciting. Very, very happy to be a part of that it. That was very cool. Very happy to. So, and speaking of that, uh, we're always Cooper Hewitt's always interested in participating in some more design competitions and. Um, was there something that you learned from that competition that you think would be good to pass on, thinking of other? Yeah, more. More. <laughs> <laughs> and what, for example, what other types of competitions you think would be good to, to have here in New York City? Oh, I mean, it's endless. You, you know, you could, the, the great thing about design competitions is you have the opportunity to bring in you know, the, art, the art, art and design community. And it's so exciting, you know, the, the eyes that they bring, mm -hmm. you know, to an issue. It could be a new design competition for summer streets and what we're gonna offer there. It could be a new design competition for, um, I would do something about the bus stops um, and, and figuring out a different way to lay those out and, and, and to play maybe a little bit more with some of the concrete um, barriers that we have. I think, you know, the, the security bollards that are all over the city, um, while very, very necessary, um, could be repurposed a little bit. Um, I was in Los Angeles recently, and in front of the Los Angeles Police Department, 
you know, you would expect to see a sea of bollards there protecting LAPD. And actually, it looked like one of uh, Margie's plantings. You know, it was just like a sea of, it looked like bioswale plantings, you know, all the way up to City Hall. So sort of reimagining what we can do in the security field, you know, mm -hmm. so that we don't create a fortress city, but we maintain the security that we need to maintain, but uh, design in um, some uh, uh, more human scale and attractive um, elements uh, to the streetscape, I think is a really interesting uh, area of opportunity. Yeah, I just I should have mentioned that Queens Plaza, the project actually started after a design competition that was run by the Van Allen Institute that uh, was actually a, a international competition to reimagine Queens Plaza. And I think I'm not in favor of competitions, sort of landscape design competitions that often, but when a project is so thorny and people really can't imagine what it could be, a competition like that that had amazing solutions was very, very influential in actually pushing that project through. So sometimes just sort of place-based competitions can actually be very good catalysts. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to remind you, we're happy to take questions. Anyone? Oh, here. Yeah. I have a quick question, and you were just talking about competitions. So this is kind of a segue into uh, what I was going to ask about. Uh, we did a project recently. It's called uh, Silent Lights, and it was done in collaboration with the DOT, and it's a uh, um, it's a visualization, it's a light visualization of traffic noise under the BQE. And uh, it took us two years to just raise the funds for that project to happen. And Wendy Purer here helped make it happen um, by connecting us to Art Place America, and they funded the project. And I was just wondering if Wendy was a platform, and I had an idea, and I could submit it to a platform where um, it could be looked over and we have talked about leadership um, being strong and uh, mayors and city officials having ideas. What if citizens and people like us want to improve our neighborhoods and we have ideas? How do we make them happen? How do we fund them? That's a great question. Um, I can answer it on the small level first, um, which is the Plaza program, which you probably know about. So ideas for how you can create a plaza out of an underutilized space uh, and, and getting the local support for that. The Department of Transportation selects those, you know, it, it's basically a crowdsourced program, right? Application-based program. So those ideas can get translated and move through, you know, into the construction process. Usually start very quickly with sort of short temporary ideas, uh, more of a guerrilla approach. Uh, to the streets, you know, with that uh, orientation. But I think you raise a really interesting uh, point, which is how do we capture the energy that's out there in communities and in neighborhoods and in the design community and the um, uh, planning community to, and, and harness that in an effective way, you know, to deal with a lot of the spaces and places uh, that we have that are potentially neglected in the city. And so coming up with that platform, what's the best way to solicit that and how do we deal with that, I think is a really important point. I mean, we've done it through our application-based programs at the Department of Transportation, or they do it now at the Department of Transportation. Um, but that's a really important idea, you know, and, and you talk about a platform, but creating that social platform, mm -hmm. uh, I think is a great assignment for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I actually have seen your project, which is really beautiful. And I think it was just published, was that right? Yeah. And um, I, I'd just like to also put a plug for design uh, that's not just visual. There's so much design going on right now that's, that's oral, uh, soundscapes, um, design really for all of the senses. So I think having some program that actually promotes design that's not just about the way things look, but the way things sound. And you saw Queens Plaza, the sound was so important. So really, raising consciousness about all the other different modes of design would be mm -hmm. something really important, really useful. I know why you're a design patron. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Jeanette, if you compare the Second Avenue subway story with what you were able to accomplish um, in such a short period of time, I have to ask the question, how did you negotiate the inertia, the politics, the bureaucracy. <laughs> Did you just go to lots and lots of benefits? <laughs> Banquets? 
No, I didn't go to lots of them. No, the benefits. How she met Adrian oh, Benefits. benefits. Benefit. 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 Uh, well, I wasn't hob I wouldn't say hobnobbing was the strategy. <laughs> um, I, I would say a couple things. One is that uh, I w it helps to work for a visionary mayor. I can't say enough about the political leadership and the political courage mm -hmm. of Mayor Bloomberg. There is there is no equivalent. Um, so that's a really important starting place. And what I did when I got there was to create a strategic plan for the department uh, and work with, you know, there are f almost 5,000 employees of the Department of Transportation, and there had not been a strategic plan for the department. So pulling everybody together and getting them to agree on what the vision was, what the policies would be, what the programs and, uh, would be, and what the benchmarks would be, that everybody agreed on was a really important way to forge consensus in the agency. Because if you come, you know, you're the commissioner of transportation, you decide, hey, I want bike lanes, bus lanes, pedestrian puzzles, let's go. You know, I mean, there is a somewhat of an innate skepticism, right? Uh, you need to pull everybody together, and it's a wildly talented agency that was ready to go. I mean, you really just needed to lift the lid off this agency, and people were filled with ideas and ready to go and had a lot of energy. Uh, I think one of the most important things I did at the time was to say, I will take the heat for whatever happens. So it is not your fault. Anything that we do is my fault. Um, and it turned out, I had <laughs> that turned out to be true. Uh, <laughs> So uh, that was a really big piece. And then we moved very, very quickly to show what could be done, because Plan YC talked about a greater, greener New York. And as you know, as you point out, New Yorkers were, were disbelieving that we could make any kind of changes based on something like Second Avenue, like this is a generational thing, like my grandchildren will see this. So lining and drawing the city that we wanted to see you know, in real time, doing things on a pilot program basis, my five favorite letter, five letter word, pilot. You know, showing it, it also reduced the anxiety in neighborhoods and communities because if it didn't work out, it's okay. We can put it back to the way that it was before, mm -hmm. right? So the idea of trying something was okay because, um, you know, the consequences were not that large. We could just erase it, basically. So that, I think, really helped. And then the final piece I would say, outside of having a great mayor, a wildly talented agency, and a good strategic plan, and a vision to get you where you need to go, because you can't change the big ship of a city without knowing the direction that you're going in, right? So that was there. Um, but I, I think that uh, uh, having all of that tied together um, was just extraordinarily important in showing that it could happen uh, in real time. And that, that really was the difference. The final piece really is that for the first time, I think all of the leaders in transportation um, at the MTA, at the Port Authority, we all knew one another. And so it made it very easy to collaborate, to pick up the phone and to say, hey, you know, I really need this lane, or, you know, hey, <laughs> you know, could you help me with the paving here? And it went back and forth. And so that, you know, when you've got that, that uh, you know, credibility and that confidence in one another, a lot of the institutional silos can go down when there's that confidence. Uh, and, and I think that continues today. Tom Prendergast is an unbelievable partner. Uh, at the MTA, and I can't say enough for what that collaboration did, not only him, but you know, Lee Sander and, and Jay Walder. There was an incredible uh, line of leaders that were there that, that, that made it a lot easier to implement some of the transit side, uh, transit programs that I think would be much more difficult to implement if you didn't have that same kind of collaborative spirit. Um, uh, I'm sorry, could you please state your name first? My name is Ev uh, Zamir. I have a general question and a specific question. Why does it take so long to learn from others how to make life easy in New York? I'll give you two examples. There were single meters. I saw it in a seaside city in, um, uh, um, in, in France in 1998. So I don't know how many years before that it was there. In London, where I studied, the subway is a lot more quiet, and you see the sign, the side, the side, the, this line will come in 10 minutes, and this, it takes us ages until we get it and we discover America, so to speak. The other thing is, why don't we steal from others simple things? <laughs> 
that can mi make life easier, like you spoke about moving people. In Taipei, in every subway station, you have in the middle where all the exits are and where are the important places that each exit leaves, and next to the exit, you have again the sign. So if you we are at the end of the train or the beginning of the train, you have the exit, and you know if you have to go from that exit or the other. And if you're in the middle, you find out the exit here, you come out, and then you find out that you're two or three blocks away, and you have to go all the way out and, and start moving slower. This is simple. This is not, you don't need to be a, a brain surgeon. And the, to the moder moderator, so you won't feel uh, neglected, <laughs> did you learn anything, for example, from a museum in Warsaw, the Chopin Museum, where you have a smart card, and you go to each exhibit, and you put the smart card next to it, and either play your music by Chopin, or tells you a story about Chopin, or, or do, does something else, and you don't interfere with others? You know what, I'd love to welcome you to Cooper Hewitt when we reopen at the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Patience a few more months. Mm. Um, I have, we're just almost at the end of our um, time, but I do have a question about, um, for our, our guests, about, and that's just about designing for an aging population. Because I do think that um, there are many aspects of New York City which are very accessible um, to the aging population, but what couple of initiatives do you think that we could be doing um, to make it even more accessible? Because well, it's a yeah. big part, you know, we're... Well, part of, part of it is, I mean, it's, New York is a great city to get old in, um, mostly because we've got a great transit system, mm -hmm. um, and it is a great walking city. And so you can walk to a lot of destinations that as you get older, it's more difficult, yeah. you know, if you have to have a car to get mm -hmm. to where uh, you need to go. So the idea of having an extensive transit system, a good bus system, a good rail system, mm -hmm. a good system of... Um, uh, pedestrian right of way and and amenities there I think those are key you're seeing a, a big move on uh, accessible taxi cabs um, we've uh, done a lot also with audible pedestrian signals the more needs to be done there mm -hmm. um, so that you can actually hear uh, the signal uh, for the sight impaired um, but uh, again as with an aging population it does bring up a lot of um, design issues in terms of how we need to do it differently. And it doesn't need to be this uh, kind of silo of aging, which sort no. of makes it be this kind of backwater. Right. You know, I mean, I remember it's the same thing with uh, designing for disabled. I worked for Mayor Dinkins, and he had this really Im important uh, idea, which I, always, I took to heart from forever after. And his uh, idea was, or his thought was, you know, we're all temporarily able, you know, which is profound because <coughs> if you look at it that way, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it, it completely changes how you approach uh, the issue. So when you take a look at, you know, the uh, handicap accessible ramps, right? I mean, you see the number of people, families with strollers, bikes, you know, everybody, you know, can exactly. benefit yeah. by that. And so I think that there is a, uh, citywide benefit that comes from designing uh, for uh, an older population or uh, a handicapped population, disabled population. I think we need to bring all of those design approaches mm -hmm. into uh, the very fabric of how we design our streets today. Yeah, and I think it's not just about accessibility, it's also about quality of life because if you design everything in a segregated way with playgrounds for children and then places for older people, you're actually going to have a less vibrant city, a less mm -hmm. safe city. So by designing multi-use places that are accessible for the elderly and that also encourage children, for instance, you'll make a much, much more sustainable landscape and city. Well, I think this is a very positive way to end. <laughs> Thank you both very much for all the wonderful work you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.